St. Bonaventure, get to know St. Bonaventure more intimately. Uh, he can at times be a little bit abstract and a little bit intimidating. And so through the course of the year, uh, we will be giving a series of lectures just to open up St. Bonaventure uh, to anyone who wants to know him. And on this conference tonight, we have uh, first order, second order, third order. Uh, we have alumni of St. Bonaventure University and, no people, and people from all across the country. And there's no better person to open up this lecture series than Dr. Tim Johnson. He is the Craig and Audrey Thorne Distinguished Professor of Religion at Flagler College in Florida. He's the author of numerous articles and some recent books, including The Prayed Francis, Liturgical Vitae and Franciscan Identity in the 13th Century, and Preaching and New Worlds, Sermons as Mirrors of Realms Near and Far. He's the chief editor of this year's 725 page volume of a new research project on St. Bonaventure, Friar, Teacher, Minister, and Bishop. It was published by the Franciscan Institute Publications and <clears throat> really, we're really proud of it because it is the evidence of uh, the North American world coming to its own in terms of Franciscan scholarship. It's a, it's a wonderful work. It's got uh, about 25 different scholars who uh, have given papers in it, and it is on sale tonight. <laughs> Special St. Bonaventure Day sale, 30% off at franciscaninstitutepublications.com. So without further ado, uh, Tim Johnson is also the chair of the Franciscan Institute's Research Advisory Council. He's a great friend and a, and a great scholar. So I'm really pleased to uh, present him to you tonight uh, to speak to us about St. Bonaventure of Bagnarijo. Tim, welcome. Thank you, Father David. Um, I want to thank Luke there for holding up the book. Um, appreciate the publicity. And as always, I want to thank uh, Jill Smith for facilitating uh, this, this gathering. I want to wish everybody, of course, a very, very happy uh, feast of uh, St. Bonaventure. I hope wherever you are, uh, you've been able to find some time to celebrate. Uh, I'm thinking, especially tonight, of all the wonderful celebrations I had at St. Bonaventure University. And I certainly wish the friars there in particular uh, every good blessing. Um, perhaps my most memorable uh, Feast of St. Bonaventure was many years ago, I had the opportunity to bring a pilgrim group to Bagnoreggio. And we were there for July 15th. And right before mass started, uh, I asked the priest who was celebrating, uh, who's preaching today? And he said, oh, you are. I said, what? <laughs> and uh, he said, well, he said, you know, the gospel is always the same. And I said, yeah, but I'm not. Um, but anyways, um, I did preach. And so I illustrate that point because what I'm going to share with you tonight is my Bonaventure. And what I mean by that is I have engaged with Bonaventure uh, for decades now. And when I do meet him time and time again on the journey of my own life, different perceptions, different inspirations, different insights come to me. So what I want to share with you tonight is pretty much uh, where I am at today when I reflect on St. Bonaventure. Uh, let me now move to what I think we're all pretty familiar with by this time, uh, me moving and sharing my screen, and so that we can begin this, um, this presentation. I would note that after the presentation, there'll be time for uh, questions, uh, comments, uh, critiques, um, typically we look for questions, right? But tonight with such an August you know, gathering here, I would also really welcome comments, uh, reflections by people as, as we move forward. So let me now go to my screen and share that. And 
I'm assuming that people can see this. Uh, I hope so. Okay, thank you, David. So I, I titled this Cruising Down Ventura Boulevard and an introduction to my St. Bonaventure. And my St. Bonaventure is not better than your St. Bonaventure. It's just the one that resonates with me. You'll notice here, uh, this is of course dedicated to uh, the incredible scholar and gentleman, uh, Father Ignatius Brady. And the picture here is of him actually in the chapel at St. Bonaventure University in 1974. Those of you who are familiar with the chap chapel uh, will recognize the image of St. Francis uh, in, in the background. I did have the unbelievably uh, good fortune to know uh, Father Ignatius Brady. When I was a young student in Rome, I went uh, out to Grotta Ferrata to meet with him on a couple of occasions. And uh, typical to the Italian style, um, after our pranzo, we were invited into his uh, room for a digestivo, a little drink to discuss, of course, Bonaventure and, and other, other matters. Um, a great man that I remember. Here's our evening journey. Uh, with Bonaventure. This is what I want to do with all of you tonight. And I'm going to first look at Bonaventure from a cultural perspective. Uh, then I'm going to look at his life and works. I'm going to talk about a particular theme that has been a driving uh, theme for me, and that's the question of desire, desire in St. Bonaventure, and especially how it emerges from his pastoral activity. I'm going to talk a little bit about reading uh, Bonaventure and the, the challenges and uh, my uh, person that I go to with this is Martin Luther, who, as I will explain, was an avid reader of Bonaventure, but he said Bonaventure drove him crazy, echoing, in fact, the sentiments of some of my own students who uh, I've tried to share the text with. So we will move forward now. So fractured memories. When we were looking at this, I hope this slide indicates what I'm trying to get across. There are different memories of Bonaventure across the landscape of North America, but it's really fractured. Uh, for example, who would have known, uh, if you look at the upper right-hand uh, image, that there was an aircraft carrier, a Canadian aircraft carrier that was named after Bonaventure. Uh, to the left, you might be familiar with this image. That's from uh, the Bonaventure Cemetery in uh, Savannah. To the right, you have a memory that uh, is still very powerful in a lot of parts of the United States, and that is the, of the powerhouse of St. Bonaventure University basketball. Um, I'm going to not dedicate this lecture to those three images. Uh, I'm going to move on, but I just wanted to give you an idea of what I'm thinking about when I, when I hear Bonaventure and, and try to get in contact with the culture around me. The picture to the bottom left actually is from New Mexico, and that is a mission uh, that was dedicated to St. Bonaventure. When I look at the United States in particular, I notice that uh, when it comes to the remembrance, if you will, across the cultural landscape of the United States, it really focuses on, to a great deal, the Spanish missionary endeavors in our country. If you go um, from Florida to California, you will find examples of different missions that were dedicated to St. Bonaventure. Now, some of them uh, are in ruins, um, but some of them, as you'll see by the dating here, are still active missions. One of the points I would underscore tonight is, in reality, during the Spanish period in the United States, Spaniards and Native Americans uh, to a certain degree, we're far more familiar with the name and person of St. Bonaventure than we are today in this country. Um, the Florida resident uh, Tom Petty uh, probably didn't know that Ventura Boulevard was named after Bonaventure, but Ventura Boulevard, of course, is connected to the mission in California and uh, has been the inspiration of any number of songs um, without, of course, giving credit to St. Bonaventure, but nevertheless, it is part of our culture. To the left, you can see an image from the church in uh, California, from the Mission Church. Here, I want to share with you some very new research, and, and we're going to take a, a moment here because um, I'm not sure how good your Spanish is, and I would doubt that your Tumuqua is, is much better than mine. What we're looking at now are three images of a book 
that was discovered recently, actually in 2019. It's a book by a Franciscan. If you take a look at the left-hand side, you'll see this uh, father was a priest of the province of St. Elena. So this is St. Elena was the Franciscan province in Florida. And it was, of course, St. Helens. It comprised Florida and Cuba. This book talks about how to go to mass. And it's, it's bilingual. Actually, it's trilingual because it has Latin phrases that are then uh, commented on in Spanish and in Tumuqua. Tumuqua is the first indigenous language in the United States with a grammar and write, written form. We have Tumuqua writers working with Franciscans as early as 1600. And what I've done, I've highlighted here in the middle picture in the right hand side also, um, where the name Bonaventure shows up in the Spanish text in the middle and the Tumuqua text on the right hand side. So as incredibly interesting as it is to me, I'm hoping that this would also um, be something that you would take note of as well and think about this a little bit, that Native Americans in Florida were not only being educated by Franciscans, but they themselves were writing and they knew about St. Bonaventure. As a matter of fact, in the incredible massacre that took place here in Florida in 1704, when the British together with the Creeks uh, eliminated the Northern uh, system of missions here, one of the chiefs that was killed, as you can see from this list, was named after Bonaventure. Bonaventure was a name known far better, I would say, in Florida in the 1600s than in the age today. So let me go on to take a quick look now, moving from culture to the life and works of St. Bonaventure. And let me just, um, I guess, warn you or console you. I'm not going to go through a long list of list looking at every single work that Bonaventure did and every moment in his life. I will highlight some things, but to the left, you're looking at the city of Bagno uh, This is, of course, where Bonaventure was born. Uh, if uh, you ever have a chance to go there, I think you'll find it uh, really, really fascinating and inspiring. It's so inspiring that Steve Rick in his, uh, Steve Rick in his uh, tour guides of Italy goes out of his way to tell tourists who have no connection really perhaps with the church, make sure you get to Bagno Reggio. It is a special site. So we're gonna go look at Bonaventure's life. And I wanted to share this picture here on the right-hand side that I really like a lot. And once again, it's from an American context. This is indigenous paintings from Cusco, Peru. And you'll see on the right-hand side, St. Anthony playing a guitar and uh, St. Bonaventure on the left playing a guitar as well. One of the things that I've noticed about uh, indigenous art and also Spanish art in the new world or what we call the new world, is it tends to be much more realistic and simple than some of the European depictions of Bonaventure. One of the stories that comes to us, and we don't really know a lot uh, about Bonaventure personally in the sense that he doesn't talk about himself a lot. But one story we have is depicted here in a painting uh, in the Louvre in uh, Paris. The story is uh, put out here in the text I won't read through the entire thing, but let me just simply point out that Bonaventure claimed that his connection to Francis of Assisi was so intimate because his very mother had prayed that Francis would heal Bonaventure. And the painting here depicts it and the text on the left talks about uh, how this came a place. Let me underscore here the fact that Bonaventure evidently was a sickly young boy. As he grows up, those who reflect on his position in the church and, and talk about him recognize that he is, um, let's say, not necessarily sickly, but he's not a strong person of penance. 
in the sense that he's not known for his fasting and vigils, um, much more for his writings and his um, theology in particular. Bonaventure gets mixed reviews from people. Um, you have, uh, you know, Alexander of Hales, his professor in Paris, saying when he looked at Bonaventure, he swore that in Bonaventure, he could not see sin. That's how innocent Bonaventure came across. Uh, one of his students, Peter John Olivi, uh, just lavished Bonaventure with praise, but he was highly critical of his theology. I had his funeral. A chronicler said that people wept for the loss of this great person. And there is a story that Bonaventure was poisoned. Now, I don't know if this has anything to do with it, but he is the patron saint of those who have stomach problems. You can make the link, if you're not. All I know is um, that's a saint that I can call on from time to time. So the last story I have here is, is really intriguing. And it just shows how some um, Franciscans did not like Bonaventure, in fact, despised him for what they thought was his role in guiding the order in a direction that they did not want to go. And this, this is a great story. I have not been able to find yet a picture of this. I'm really hoping I can find a picture of this last story where Bonaventure's nails grow and he goes after John of Parma, who cries out, and Christ hears him and gives a flint to Francis, who comes down and shaves off his nails. Um, the point I'm trying to make here is that uh, Bonaventure is seen in different ways by different people. There are images through time that um, appear. The one on the left I just found actually the other day. This is a, a, a lady who's working with the uh, Mexican Spanish form of retalgos and came up with this image of um, Bonaventure. In the middle is the classic picture that we often see. This is found uh, in the Vatican, uh, painted by Raphael. And on the right hand side, I want you to take a look at the images on the bottom. This is a book uh, that comes from a theologian in Europe who's writing about Scotus. And quite frankly, it doesn't mention Bonaventure, but notice how simple Bonaventure is depicted here at the bottom in the, on the right hand side. Pretty much a friar, um, obviously priestly vestments, but certainly not elaborate or exalted. Here's the part where the, in the presentation, um, people looking that this could be overwhelmed uh, with, with the dates and, and all the data that goes with those dates. So clearly I'm not gonna read through every one of these. Uh, I'll spare you from that. But let me point out right in the beginning, 1217, 1221, there are differing ideas of when Bonaventure was born. Uh, those who do research on the chronology of his life have different opinions, but uh, I tend to now think more in terms of 1221, but since we celebrated um, 2017 and came up with that great book, uh, I'm not against the 2017 date uh, either. So think about this. Bachmanshire is a young man growing up in the middle of Italy, small town, Parents are probably well off. He gets sent to Paris to study liberal arts. Something happens to him in Paris that leads him to decide that he wants to join the friars, and he does. One thing uh, that is uh, intriguing to me is the fact that he may have even studied philosophy with Roger Bacon uh, even before he came a friar. He studies with the best of the friars in Paris, becomes a master himself, and the works that he's done, many of them have been translated into English by the Franciscan Institute, include commentaries on the scripture, a commentary on Peter Lombard's uh, sentences, Peter Lombard's sentences, for those of you who um, don't read them every day and don't know what they are, uh, they are a collection of texts that talk about different theological issues. And if you were going to be a master, you had to comment on those questions. 
he becomes, as I said, a master. He then, 1257 is the crucial date for me and for my Bonaventure. And I say that because this is what I call the pastoral turn, the pastoral turn in the life of Bonaventure, when he has to give up being a professor and become an administrator. Those of you, um, and I'm sure many of you, have been in that situation of doing one thing and then doing another and maybe being involved as an administrator for some time. And you know that how that changes your spirituality and your view. As an administrator, you sent, tend to see things differently. Bonaventure, when he becomes administrator, starts to focus, quite frankly, on the friars and the practical needs of the friars. So I'll talk a little bit about that later, but this is the time now when he comes out with any number of sermons, his Lives of St. Francis. Uh, he is eventually named a bishop and cardinal. Um, he is president of the Council of Lyon, and he dies there suddenly. And like I said, there is a rumor that he was poisoned. Uh, he was canonized by Pope Sixtus and then made a doctor of the church. We talk about him as the seraphic doctor uh, in 1587. Let me um, try to go back here, if I can, and show you an image here to give you an idea of what the pastoral turn means. This is Bonaventure's travel itinerary between 1258 and 1260. Notice how he is on the move. He is walking. Remember, the friars aren't supposed to use horses. Uh, he's walking from place to place to place on foot. I'm convinced that this had a profound impact on how he saw the world, and in particular, how he interpreted St. Francis. Because it's now on the road that he becomes truly an itinerant. Uh, he is no longer in the classroom. He is at the mercy of the weather, of the landscape, of the food that served to him. All these different things are going to, I believe, bring him to a point where he now can see Francis in a way that he could not, and because of that, is able to share that Francis and the Franciscan ideas with the friars in a new way. Uh, notice, if you can hear, all of the sermons that are given in the south of France. These are when Bonaventure comes back from his experience on Mount Alverna, and he's on his way to the uh, chapter in Narbonne. All around Narbonne, uh, which is number 22 here on the map, uh, he's preaching to any number of, of people. And he had a secretary that recorded these sermons for us today. Desire for Christ on the road. This is my, like I said, in a certain way, this is my Bonaventure at this time in my life. Uh, on the journey of life, the desire for Christ. You're looking here at two images. One on the left is the hermitage uh, on Mount Laverna, and the right is a, is a road going up into the hills. Imagine Bonaventure walking up to this place. By the way, walking all the way from France. I am assuming that Bonaventure was following the medieval trade routes. You can see them here depicted. Uh, the picture of, on the right is of yours truly on the Camino. I had the incredible uh, good fortune of going on the Camino to uh, Santiago de Compostela. And that's where I got a feel for the road. You can walk maybe at the most about 20 miles a day, but you are really at the mercy, like I said, of the landscape, the temperature, and most of all, your body, at what your body feels as, as you're walking. Now, Bonaventure, uh, like I said, in this pastoral turn, and we heard it in the beginning too, and Father David mentioned this, and I think it's, it's true. Many people think that Bonaventure is quite speculative, difficult to understand, and I don't deny that at all. But this one sermon that I translated 
uh, a number of years ago shows you that he's also very attentive to where he is. So he's walking on roads all over Europe for years on end, he's on the road. And he thinks about what, what, what can I learn from a road? And I put here in yellow, just as a material road is a particular rule that directs a person lest one deviate into error and leads one instead to his native city, so too. So as he's walking, he's thinking about his spiritual life and he's using a road as, a, as an example. He's walking on the road, thinking about his spirituality, thinking about what he's seen on the road and how a road is even made. And he begins to realize that everything in the built environment and the natural environment speaks of God in some way or another. And so you can see later, I said a material road, or I translated the material road is propelled, prepared well in three ways. By the way, if you don't know Bonaventure, it's always going to be threes. Uh, it will always be threes. So the road becomes a way of helping him understand what he needs to do to prepare for Christ and to receive Christ as he's on the road. What's on your Christmas list? What do you, what, what do you want? Um, this is a translation that I did of, I think, my favorite sermon of Bonaventure. Notice the top. He's taking from the Canticle of Canticles. Who will give you to me for my mother, sucking on the breast of my mother? Now, I don't know about your experience at uh, Christmas Eve masses, but I have never heard a priest use that text as the introdu introduction to um, the beautiful, wonderful day of Christmas. What I find so inviting about this is that it paints a picture of the incarnation that is based on our desire and not our sin. Bonaventure gives us here an anthropology of desire. Why did God come? Not because I was bad, not because um, I did something wrong. Why does he come? Because just like a lover cannot be satisfied until the lover holds the beloved, so too did we cry out, humanity cried out for the object of our love, which is Christ. And we didn't, according to Bonaventure, we didn't want that in a speculative way. We actually wanted to be able to hold this lover in our arms. Who will give you to me? So this idea of walking down the road, desiring Christ, wanting Christ to come as a lover, which may sound odd to us, given our cultural situation, but it's part and parcel to Bonaventure's anthropology. We want Christ present. So when we look at how Bonaventure writes about Francis, we find, in fact, a couple places where he talks about the visible, tangible fulfillment of the desire that I just mentioned. This is a um, text that I want to pay a little bit of extra attention to right now. I've highlighted a number of the verbs in yellow. What is, I think, compelling here is that they're in the present tense. Now, not to go off on a tangent here, but this is the historical present in Latin. And what the author is trying to do in this case, Bonaventure, is when someone is reading the text, he wants that person to feel as if that event is going on right now. It's not a past historical moment that he's calling to mind. The brothers are summoned. The people arrive. Francis is chanting. He's preaching. In other words, Bonaventure wants us to be present at that moment and experience with Francis. What happens? That desire that I mentioned in that sermon becomes tangible, even in the vision, because someone claimed that they saw Francis actually holding the baby. Here is when desire 
becomes embodied in Christ. When desire gets the best of us, what do I mean by that? Uh, in the journey of the mind to God, remember that was the text that I talked about how he went from France, he went to Laverna, he reflected on the life of Francis, then he came back and he preached uh, in, around in Southern France, leading up to the, um, the general chapter in Narbonne, 1260. I have a different interpretation of this text than you'll often find. Notice, I put this, of course, transitus, Bonaventure is always in this journey motif. But notice how I've done this, and I can be challenged on this, but this is different. I have the translation saying, I change direction, okay? If you look at most translations of this text, you will see that uh, translators tend to say, I, I was called, I was inspired, I desire what I'm trying to do here by looking at that verb closely, declinare, is I think Bonaventure said, I changed my mind about what I was going to do, and I decided that I need to get in contact with St. Francis. I need to go to Laverna. This wasn't just he happens to be passing by or is inspired. No, I changed my plans. And notice how intensive those plans were with the different preaching here, there, and there. No, I changed my direction so that I could go to this place where Francis received the stigmata. On the left is, um, once again, we're talking about my Bonaventure, my approach. Uh, this is my most, uh, if you will, beloved image of the stigmata. This happens to be on the book that David mentioned, uh, The Prayed Francis. It's a beautiful, beautiful uh, image. Notice the uh, seraph, but also notice the animals, the incredible collection of animals here. And this will be a theme as I'm gonna to touch on soon with regards to Bonaventure. But here we go again, a visible, tangible fulfillment of desire. Just as Francis holds the baby, Christ in the crib, now Francis is held and transformed by the crucified Christ. It's visible and it's tangible. Let's move on to reading Bonaventure here. Um, once again, sorry uh, to insert a picture of yours truly, but this is me uh, outside the door Raised in my fist, you may remember the story of Martin Luther, um, the reputed uh, 95 theses being nailed on the church door. We're right in front of that door. I was there with a group of uh, students from Flagler College. Martin Luther read Bonaventure, and he read him closely, especially at a transitional moment in his life. On the left-hand side, you can see a picture from uh, his home. You see the table there. The text I'm uh, using comes from his Tischweden, um, talks at the table. And this is what he says. You can see how he's looking to change. And Martin Luther is like Bonaventure, like Francis, a man of desire. Luther was so hungry to experience the union of the mind and the will. He tried and he tried, and he recognized in Bonaventure that Bonaventure was um, not only optimus, the best as far as scholastic theologians, but Bonaventure had experienced what he wanted to, and he became more and more frustrated because as he read the itinerarium and other texts, they seemed to get in the way, actually, of the experience. And so he ultimately talked about how he uh, just could not stand Bonaventure's, uh, what we'll term the elevator of the mind. The idea that, you know, you start at stage one, then you go to stage two and you go to stage three. Imagine you're in an elevator, you push floor one, push floor two. That kind of idea of a systematic ascent to God just did not work for uh, Martin Luther. And I would point out, it, 
we don't have to be experts here in language to notice that on the bottom, you see where I've highlighted the German in yellow. Notice how Bonaventure is, is spoken of, first of all, by Luther in terms of, of Latin, but then he moves into German when he says, this guy drove me crazy. You have this sort of, now the text might've been glossed, it might've been redacted, but you still get the sense of how Martin Luther is struggling and many people do struggle with Bonaventure. So with my Bonaventure, how do I approach the difficulty of reading him? Because he is difficult. Um, here's a story that comes to us. I think it uh, can be traced back at least as far as Luke Wadding. It might be uh, anecdotal, but it's a story I like. And I like the image, by the way, on the right-hand side of Bonaventure. You see him holding that stick. Now that might be a reference to the Tree of Life, but I like to think of this, of, of him on the road. He has a walking stick here. How does the story go? Let me read this. A brother who was unable to get close to him in a convent in Foligno due to a crowd of religious waited for him on the road. Father, he said, I need to speak with you. Bonaventure stopped immediately. And the two of them sat down together on the side of the road. After the discussion, the minister general rejoined the others who were rather irritated. Could I have acted otherwise? Am I not his servant? Is he not my master? So here's the methodology I propose. Bonaventure walks by us. What question would we want to ask him? What are we interested in? What are our desires? When I was doing my dissertation in Rome, I worked with a wonderful Jesuit by the name of Zoltan Alziki. He told me one time, uh, find someone from history that you can dialogue with, that you can ask questions. So when I'm working with people, uh, who are reading Bonaventure, one of the questions that I ask them is, what are you interested in? What do you want to discover? So when I use this methodology, I go to a text, and now I'm talking of, of, of my Bonaventure. This is a, a sermon that I translated, and for me, it's fascinating, theologically, to just consider what's at work here. It's about the transfiguration, but what's happening in the transfiguration? Bonaventure makes the claim, following here, I believe, Gregory the Great, that Christ shares something with every creature in the cosmos, including rocks, plants, sensibility, understanding. In other words, part Christ is linked to all the cosmos. And in the transfiguration of Christ, the entire cosmos is transfigured. So do animals go to heaven? I, I don't know. But here it would seem that they are transfigured. The question of animals is, um, something that draws many people's attention, including myself, and not just because people have pets. It's because ever since Darwin, we have realized that we share much with animals in a way that we couldn't even imagine. And the topic theoretically of animality is, is something that uh, scholars are looking at. So now I, I wonder, what does Bonaventure have to say about animals? In his commentary on the sentences, uh, by the way, in the commentary in the census is the first place that I found a reference to uh, St. Francis in Bonaventure's writings. Might be somewhere else, but that's what I found. In the commentary, he says, Francis was surrounded by animals who were at peace because it was as if they were back in Eden when they were in the presence of Francis. So this idea of the relationship uh, between uh, human beings and the world is something that not only is found in, in Francis of Assisi and others, but Bonaventure picks this up. And in a very beautiful way, he talks about how animals before and after the fall differ. And it calls us to consider, I believe, our role in creation and how we look at the world, and more importantly, perhaps how we treat the world. But this is what God wanted to do in the cosmos through animals, at least according to Bonaventure. He gives us 
a number of different uh, things here, especially beauty, especially diversity, especially desired focus intent on doing what we are called to do. This is what animals, according to Bonaventure, teach us. With the fall, what happened? Now animals have to provide us nourishment. They have to provide us clothing. They have to uh, assist with manual work. They have to be our servants when before they were much more our companions. They now serve. But they continue to offer solace. Um, I really enjoyed this little part when I was reading it. Uh, animals still give us solace. And he mentions in particular birds and cats. Why is that? Well, one of the reasons is birds and cats are much easier to keep in a monastery or a friary than dogs. Um, I know, for example, in the past, at least uh, when I was uh, in St. Louis, in the friary there, there was a dog for a while, but there were so many masters, the dog just couldn't handle it. Cats don't need a master. Matter of fact, they're masterful. Birds, they're part of it. You can have them in a cage. You can take care of them. And I even came across an image of, of Bonaventure. You may have heard the story of how when Bonaventure was named uh, Cardinal, they brought the red hat and he was in the kitchen and, and he put it up and he was doing dishes. Now, maybe that's anecdotal or not, but one of the pictures I found showed a cat in the, in the room when he's doing dishes. So we see um, this idea of solace that's important for many of us. Today, I went outside and I filled our bird feeder to the point of overflowing. It's the Feast of, of Bonaventure. I wanted animals to celebrate. I wanted the cardinals in particular, where we have a yard full of cardinals. Sometimes it looks like a papal uh, conclave here. I wanted nature to uh, just enjoy this day. Now, did I do it for sentimental reasons? Perhaps. Did I do it also because it's a good thing to do? Yes. And I didn't even care if the squirrels took some of the seed. So here's where I end up. What then is our relationship to the cosmos? Once again, remember, let me step back. The methodology I've been trying to propose here is Bonaventure is walking by. What kind of question did we ask? I read a text that raised the question of Christ, the cosmos, and us, I followed through to find a couple places where Bonaventure talks about animals, and I shared that with you. And by the way, in the same text, he talks about how the diversity of creatures becomes a song. It's a common, it's a song that God sings in the universe through his creation. As we move to the end, conclusions, comments, and questions. Um, here's just a very quick list of what I've published on Bonaventure. I wanted to show you this just so you didn't think I was making stuff up tonight. Um, so I've been, I've been working on this for, for a while here. And uh, I bring this to an end and I thank um, all those people, especially I'm thinking now of Father Wayne Hellman. I'm thinking of Father Octavian Schmucki. I'm thinking of Father Pompey, Alfonso Pompey, um, others, Sultan Alziki, who have accompanied me in my journey. And I have and continue to hold a great debt of appreciation and gratitude for those friars in particular that have helped me on my own journey with Bonaventure. So with that, um, we are at 45 minutes, it looks like, and uh, that is my uh, presentation for you. Uh, comments, questions, critiques, 
be welcome to entertain them if you have. Um, you could put something. Oh, I saw, um, I have a, a request here to go back to the prelapsarian. I see that in the chat. So let me go back and I'll bring that up real quick. Perhaps someone was taking notes and uh, wanted to get another chance. Now this is being recorded. It will be released if we think it's a good video uh, and if it's worth watching. So there might be a chance to review this again. Anybody have any questions, thoughts? You can put them in. Um, Tim, I'll make a plug that in, in the book that we've been talking about tonight, I have a uh, an essay on this topic. So, so if anybody I'm, wants, Tim, which Tim actually gave me some suggestions for when we were in the editing process. So look, thanks for bringing that up. And also, could you mention then how this will tie into your lecture that you're going to be giving in this series? Because I'm really excited that you're going to be taking part in it. I'll say a word. So my next, uh, my lecture will be next in this series. And it's actually a wonderful segue with the, what Tim has had to say uh, today, because I'll be looking at the question of how, well, God sings in the cosmos through the creatures. Uh, I'll be looking at especially how uh, creation and scripture are both uh, based on the prototype and archetype of the word, the God, the son, the son of God. And, uh, We'll get to see uh, how this cosmic role of Christ plays out both in, in scripture and in nature and how they're a, a united way of speaking. I won't give much more away than that because I have to write it, but <laughs> it's going to be great. It's going to be great right into it. But I don't want to say too much. Let other people speak. OK, I'm just going to pick up. There's a couple uh, questions here in the chat and I'll try to respond to them quickly. And please, um, you know, let me know if I'm not responding satisfactory. Um, Jack Daniels, who is actually a good friend of mine, um, little story here, he is a librarian at uh, Flagler College. He used to have his name Jack Daniels on his desk, but it disappeared so often uh, due to students that um, uh, he now has a desk in the back. Anyways, Jack is a, a wonderful a scholar and he's got a question here about altered states of consciousness. And I don't know what work in particular has been done, Jack, but I would say, uh, that you're exactly right about altered states of consciousness with regards to uh, walking. Because as I mentioned on the, the Camino to, uh, that I did in Compostela and, and others have made, there is a different state of consciousness. And I'm not saying that it's crazy, wild or different, but you do get into a different state of reflection when you are walking. I mean, runners will talk about this too, correct? Um, I'm not a runner. But um, I, I do walk and we walked a lot and it does open up different uh, areas of, of the consciousness and make people more sensitive and sensible, I think, uh, in, especially to, to potentially spiritual matters, spiritual understood in, in the uh, broad sense. Someone asked about Peter John Olivi's objections to Bonaventure. Um, Olivi uh, did not like a number of uh, Bonaventure's positions on different issues. And there is always in the background here, the question of, of the apocalypse and Olivi's approach and uh, Bonaventure's approach. Uh, we could get into the weeds here um, and I'd be happy to share um, something with someone if they wanna write me about the more particulars of his uh, refined critique of Bonaventure with regards to philosophical and spiritual issues. But one of the great things about Olivia, among others, is that we, we have him as a witness to Bonaventure preaching. And he made the claim that Bonaventure said that he would be ground to dust. Bonaventure was speaking of himself. He would be ground to dust if uh, it would lead to the purity of, of the order. Uh, we will, um, you know, I'll talk to uh, Father David and Jill about uh, 
you know, releasing the video. I see there's a comment about that. Um, forgive me for any um, typos that I might have missed in uh, the video, but um, uh, they will be there, I'm sure. But Swimmers 2, I see Jack, uh, Father Jack, um, talking about Swimmers 2. Uh, someone mentioned they didn't think, or really don't think about Bonaventure as a walker, and I really didn't either until I started looking at his sermon schedule. And I just gave you two years. This man spent the majority or a good part of his ministry walking. And I cannot doubt that that influenced uh, him. Um, let's see what else. Um, someone asked about um, the, uh, the mission period. And certainly um, because of the Spanish, Bonaventure was incredibly well known, and I would just point this out, that when it came to the training of friars in Spain and here in the Americas, they termed or they looked at SCOTUS for theology, but Bonaventure was their spiritual guide. Uh, friars were formed in the spirituality of St. Bonaventure, and remember in Franciscan Florida, all the missions were Franciscan, which means all these uh, communities of Wale, Appalachia, Tumuqua, and others were formed by Franciscans. And when you look at the list of their names, I've just put it up there briefly, you'll see that uh, there are any number of Franciscan names. And matter of fact, there's a cause now for the canonization of these Native Americans who were killed. And the chief one is um, Antonio Cuipa, who named his daughter Claire and his son Francis. Now, the Spanish period, of course, is ignored uh, pretty much by uh, Americans in many different ways. So Bonaventure moves off the cultural uh, landscape. When it comes to Aquinas, um, there is a moment in church history where the church moves to, to make Thomas the theologian uh, at, the, um, you know, at the expense of Bonaventure, Scotus, and, and others. Uh, once again, if someone wants more on that, uh, one of my professors, Orlando Tedisco in Rome, wrote a wonderful article comparing uh, Bonaventure and uh, on Aquinas. Um, looking at a number of these different questions. I'm very interested, I'm looking at Jonathan's here, I'm very interested in the mystical dimension of his exegesis, the moment of mystical encounter, when all other forms of knowledge are gathered together and find their fulfillment in Christ. The cultural situation, I mean, if we're talking about the cultural situation of today and how Bonaventure has been interpreted, um, that is difficult to connect to mystical experience. But here's the cultural dimension that I think is very much connected to mystical experience. It is not only, okay, let me step back. So for Bonaventure, the first book is the world, right? The first book that God writes is the wor world. Because we have sin, we can't read the world anymore. We can't read this book of the world. If we had not sinned, we wouldn't need sacred scripture. Forgive me some uh, of you who um, may find that difficult, uh, but the book of scripture, according to Bonaventure, Jonathan, comes into existence because of our sin. So now scripture helps us interpret the world. And the anagogical sense, which is the fourth level of exegesis, helps us read the world in a mystical fashion. And so that's where I see the connection, just responding right now to, to your question. Of course, we could go into that more deeply, but think about this. Bonaventure on the road is reading the world. He's reading the world as he walks. He then goes to scripture to try to interpret what he's seen in the world, but he also then looks to St. Francis to see how Francis read the world. That is going to lead Bonaventure to his own mystical experience, which is going to be much different than Francis's in the sense of methodology. But as far as the essence of the mystical experience, I can't tell you if they're the same or not. Uh, that is an interior reality that I cannot judge, but certainly it's, it's there. Uh, 
Viviana, down at University of Miami. Uh, hi, great to see you after, you know, writing back and forth. Um, yeah, well, of course he's the higher doctor, right? I mean, he's the seraphic doctor. Um, of course he's higher, um, at least, you know, for those of us uh, of, of the Franciscan spirit. I mean, uh, the seraphic is identified with red, right? So if you have a European degree in theology, you actually wear red because that was the highest level of, of knowledge connected with the seraph, not just any angel, but 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 the seraph, right? Um, when I wear my um, gowns, I have that red. Student one asked me, said, I want to get a gown like that. I said, well, it'll probably cost you, you know, a decade and a hundred thousand dollars, but uh, it, that's what you'd have to do. So um, the move to Aquinas, and we may have Aquinas scholars here, um, I certainly don't want to uh, suggest uh, that Aquinas uh, is secondary. Obviously, he's not. Let's face it, they're both contemporaries in Paris. They're both extremely talented, but they do have different insights. And as um, even um, Cardinal Ratzinger, Pope Benedict said, Bonaventure focuses on love and Aquinas focuses on truth. Now, they're obviously not mutually exclusive, but there are differences. There are differences. And so the will and love is what's important for Bonaventure. And that's why I think um, there's such a strong emphasis on desire uh, throughout Bonaventure's writings. Uh, and um, I teach a course at Flagler called The Erotic God, which has probably rings rather odd to some people, but I gave it that name for one reason. I just wanted to see it in the class schedule online to see that, that title there, I thought it would be a good title. But we talk about desire and we talk about how important desire is in the Christian tradition. Quite frankly, this is liberating for college students, not because they can go out then and do whatever they want, but they realize that desires are not their enemies. It's part of the human condition. And what Bonaventure does is helps us understand how to channel and focus desire. So I'm trying to see if there, um, David, do you see any questions in, in the chat that I'm yeah, not? There's one from Darlene Prides. Could, could um, you read it off? Uh, oh, wait, I see that. Darlene is asking about um, the question of desire and Lady Jacoba. Why did Bonaventure erase her from the uh, narrative? I don't think it had anything to do about desire, but I do think um, he's not particularly interested in her, in her and that story. And that is, uh, you know, one of the critiques that we would definitely make of Bonaventure is, or at least from our present day, that he's not particularly sensitive to some of the things that are especially powerful in the life of Francis himself. He picks and chooses. He has his Francis. Um, I have my Bonaventure. And that's not an excuse for him, but it's certainly a lacuna in his writings if you're approaching it uh, from a perspective of trying to understand his relationship, desire, and men and women, without a doubt. Xavier Schubert asked the question, what was the influence of any, if any, of Maximus the Confessor to Bonaventure? The former seems to have developed the themes of the itinerarium similar to Bonaventure? Boy, that's a question that I really can't answer without making stuff up um, at this point in time. I don't know if there's someone in um, the audience tonight who could respond to that. Um, I don't mind, to, I could say a little bit. Oh, Lou, please, please do. I can say just a very short amount on the question of Maximus the Confessor um, in that we don't really see a lot of Maximus being drawn explicitly into Bonaventure. He doesn't really have too much to say about him, but we know Maximus is lying out there in the background because Bonaventure probably did read uh, Ereugena, who uh, did read Maximus the Confessor and was the principal translator of Dionysius, of Pseudo Dionysius. And um, Bonaventure may have also been familiar with the writings of Honorius Augustodonensis, who was familiar with Ereugena and maybe also Maximus the Confessor. So we don't know necessarily much about what he read specifically, but we do know that Maximus's influence is getting out into the medieval world through 
uh, Eriugena, but Eriugena was sometimes a, a suspect figure. Now, what's interesting about Eriugena is that um, in one of the big handbooks of Pseudo Dionysius that was used in Paris, uh, there are, which includes Dionysius's, uh, rather, Eriugena's translation and his commentary on Pseudo Dionysius, it also includes original works by Eriugena there under the name of Maximus. Okay. And that was in Paris at the time that Bonaventure was writing. So what is Maximus doing? Well, he's probably there in the background somewhere. So he might not be getting Maximus directly, although perhaps some, uh, since the amount of available Greek is, you know, hard to say, but definitely there in Bonaventure's sources. So we can say that. Luke, thank you so much. And that's why I appreciate being in a community of scholars. Um, Thank you, thank you very much. Real quick comment on the journey motif. One thing that I would note also is Bonaventure's itinerarium is different than earlier um, texts that deal with an itinerarium type of scenario because he uses Francis of Assisi as a paradigm instead of, for example, Moses. Why is that important? Because many of the people who have been, would be reading the itinerarium would have known Francis. So to shift the uh, paradigm out of ancient Christian history into the historical present is indicative of the shift towards history that's going to mark uh, the Franciscan interpretation of the world, social action, uh, preaching, et cetera. Someone asked me also real quick, I see there's a, um, a reference to Lydia Schumacher's project. Lydia uh, Schumacher is a professor in England. She received a grant to work on the Franciscan intellectual tradition with a special emphasis on Alexander of Hales. Uh, for those interested, uh, everything that she's been working on on this project is open access and you can find it um, very easily online. It's a wonderful project from a number of perspectives, especially when it comes to Alexander of Hales. Uh, people can agree and, or disagree with particular interpretations of Bonaventure and, and uh, Alexander, et cetera. But Lydia is doing a wonderful job of getting scholars to go back and look at the professor, the teacher of Bonaventure uh, himself. So um, we are graced by the fact that she's doing that work. I'll leave it to scholars to uh, read that work and then critique it as from their perspectives. Someone asked something about living in the divine will. Could uh, could that person comment on that? Because I, I'm I, I'm hope I, I hope I'm doing it, but I may not understand understand it here in this case. Does anybody? Um, let's see. Whoever made that comment, do they want to develop that or the idea of the living will? spirituality? If not, uh, Jack Clark, uh, Father Jack Clark out in Albuquerque also asks this question about the preference for the Legenda Mayor and the lack of Chilano in the colonial uh, uh, preference. This is really interesting to me because my Bonaventure at this point in my life is particularly concerned with preaching and liturgical celebration. So what was the text that the friars, of course, read would be the Legenda Maior if they had a copy in their friary, but the text that they had in their bravery was Legenda Minor. And that's why if you are looking at Bonaventure from a American cultural perspective and I would say this across the board with Franciscan spirituality. I think it's better to start with the Legenda Minor because this was the Francis that was prayed through the centuries by the friars and those laity that joined the friars. Not the Legenda Minor, but the Legenda Minor. That's the text that was prayed. That was the Francis that people met, if you will. And the Legenda Minor was actually translated into Aztec. Not well, there's a, there's a text of the Legenda Minor in an indigenous language which shows you how important that text was in developing the image of Francis of Assisi among indigenous peoples. 
I'm probably missing um, some questions here. Uh, David, uh, Jill, do you see anything that, that I'm missing here that I, I, I need to comment on? I, no, I don't want to skip anybody, but there's a number of questions, so. I, I've looked at it. I think you've hit all of them so far. Okay. Um, if anybody wants to unmute, uh, please feel free to do that and, and ask a question or comment too. Um, you don't have to necessarily just put in the chat. You can certainly unmute and share your um, your ideas with us. If not, um, I'm going to, at this point in time, uh, which is I think around the point of time that we're supposed to bring this to a conclusion, I will give it back to Father David. Once again, thank you all for your incredible uh, you know, generosity in joining me tonight to hear about my Bonaventure. Uh, if we had time, I would love to hear about your uh, Bonaventure. Uh, I would urge you to ask the question, what are your desires? And how are those reflected in Bonaventure, which means you don't have to sit down and read the entire itinerary. You can get texts from the Franciscan Institute. Yes, this is a plug, but the texts are important. You can take those texts and look at the table of contents and the index to find themes that you're interested in so that you can build your own theology from those writings by going immediately to the places in the books where it mentions what you're interested in as well. That would be a methodology that, that I would propose. If you just pick up the book and start reading it, you will be like Martin Luther, uh, I, I would suggest, unless you are particularly uh, gifted and have been able to uh, you know, spend a tremendous amount of time. It took me years to actually get to the point where I thought that I was inside the system, so to speak, for years, I felt like I was just like knocking on that door. You saw me knocking on that door, trying to get into Bonaventure's thought. Finally, I had a, a moment where I started to see how everything came together. I won't call it a mystical event, um, but it was a moment where I could see, wow, this kind of all hangs together. How do you do that? I would suggest identify your desires, go to Bonaventure's text, find themes that resonate with you and reflect on those. You don't have to do the you know, the steps to, um, you know, of the itinerarium. Uh, someone asked me, by the way, let me just close with this. Someone um, asked me the other day, how do you deal with stress? And I said, um, well, I meditate. And they said, well, what app do you use? I said, well, I, I, don't, I don't have an app, but what I do is I get a cup of coffee in the morning and sit out on my, my lanai and look at the woods. Um, that's a great start. That's a great a start for the ascent of the mind into God, at least from this place in Florida. So, David, Father David, I'll give it back to you. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Tim. This was very exciting, very inspiring, very illuminating uh, first step for us to engage with Bonaventure in a new way. I think you're absolutely right. Bonaventure started with reading the book of creation and getting back in touch with nature. And by reading that and then reading scripture, bringing the two together, he moves further along and he teaches us, I think that methodology. So thank you for that. We will be coming back together. Hopefully you're all invited back for our next uh, presentation, which Dr. Luke Togni will be giving in September, September 15th, I think it is. Uh, same place, same station, uh, same website. So thank you all for coming. Have a great night. Happy Feast of St. Bonaventure. God bless you all. Thank Buona you. festa. Buona festa a tutti. Tim, you'll want to know that the propeller for the HMCS Bonaventure